Society. I'm Susan Williams. I'm their president. Quote. <laughs> As you can see, we are currently in the continental grand battle of corruption through the efforts of Mr. Jeff Dreisbach, who will be telling you bits and pieces about this. And of course, everyone is well aware of this beautiful house. And people seem to forget that because the Baron came to town, the American people have paid. Steel maker, not a glass maker, that came at a later time. So we are so thrilled that the Evans have been able to add this collection to us and uh, the history and
these particular plates uh, to make this complete jam stove, and we can do it. I can get somebody to make a top, which is just be you know the flat iron and the bottom, and then we get um, a stone to support it. And if we ever wanted to, to make a complete one, we could. This happens to be what they call the treasure of 1758. Uh, there's a date on it which tells us that year. But what's interesting about this is it also has the initials of John Barr, and then it has W, and then it has ST for Stiegel. Um, Barr was a, um, he was a partner with uh, Stiegel in the very beginning, and he was only here for a couple years, and then he sold his interest. But that's how we know that it was early. Uh, there's another plate down here that has his initials too, so we can take that. Uh, again, this is typical of, of the jam plates. The, where it says uh, where your treasure is in German script here. And again, it's also where your treasure is here on this side too. So the plates are identical except for the margin left or right side. And then it wraps around and then here it says it's also your heart. A lot of biblical terms and verses that, that, that Stephen would use back then. Uh, the next plate we get into is we get into what we call the six plate stove, the seven plate stove, um, ten plate stove. So this particular die or this particular picture here, this is one that came out of the Danner collection. So this is a picture of a of a uh, Stiegel ten plate stove. It's real pretty. It just so happens that the front of this plate is also the front plate that they used on the hero plate here. That you see, same thing. Again, uh, this would be a, it's a floral pattern. What you don't see on this plate, is, because it's pretty worn, and I always wanted to get this particular plate in my collection. This is the only one that I ever saw that came up for at auction. Um, so there's not many of them around. But on the very bottom, it does say Stiegel. Um, what happens with most all of these plates, the degradation with, because of rust and where the heat box is, and the heat is basically up there, really on the bottom. So that's where it starts to really rust, and, and it's, it's, that's where it really starts to get gray faster than any other part of the stove, typically. So that's why I don't see Stiegel there. That would have been a very small six plate that he would have made back then. Um, then we go to the hero plate. It's kind of like the center of collection for the hero, or I mean, of all the plates that they have. Uh, this particular plate, you can kind of use, and uh, we're not sure why. I think there's, I have my theory on it. There's a few things about this plate that show uh, some manufacturing flaws. For example, you can see a line like right near his eye. That's where the mold line was. These molds are, you know, they're, they're, they're put together, solid, you know, pieces of uh, hogging, and then they're hard. So you can actually see the nails there protruding. You can see the line there where the knives, that knife should just wrap around really nice and it falls down. So there's a few things that I think maybe they didn't like about it and they didn't use it. Why they didn't destroy it and, and go back in uh, the furnace is beyond me because quite honestly up at our site where we're doing our digs, there's, we find pieces of stove plate all the time that have mortar and that on it that they use actually in the, like if, they're, if, if they need a little gin, uh, uh, what do I say, uh, like a, a bridge stone or a shit or something like that, they use these plates. Uh, that were, you know, bad, and so we find a lot of that. Um, actually, up at Cornwall, when I've been through their furnace, you can see some iron sticks out, so they did the same thing there. So, I don't know if it, you know, if it changes the batch or whatever, but for whatever reason, I just, I don't think they broke them and throw them back in. Um, one thing I failed to say is the collection here that you see, it, it's, it's done over a period of 40-some years, and I collected through this basically four means I, I, I got them. Most of them were public auctions, um, poop and poop, Conestoga has all around here. Um, and then the next thing was basically I, in the early years I advertised heavily in the merchandiser and the newspaper just saying uh, interested in anything Stiegel, I paid top dollar. You know, I tried to get them good, but anyway. <laughs> so uh, that was another way. And then word of mouth, word of mouth just started coming around and uh, people said, hey, you know, they heard I was collecting and I, could, I have something that would be interested in buying it. I said, yeah, I'll look at it. And last but not least, uh, the thing called eBay that came out. And this particular plate here, and I also have another hero plate uh, that I did sell. I kept one plate from my collection. That, both of those hero plates came off of eBay. Uh, this particular one came off of uh, eBay and it was a barn that was filled with antiques 
piece up in the uh, Woodstock, New York area. And the barn was just loaded with stuff, and it was really high quality antiques. And a family, they, they lived there for many years, and they had this barn. They said, look, it's loaded with antiques. The antiques were in when we came on the farm, and you, you sell them. So some guy started pulling stuff out and selling them on eBay. I actually bought another stove plate uh, in the same barn that was done down in the Shenandoah Valley. It was a beautiful plate, and that plate is in a museum down there. Uh, it, was, it was bought at auction. So anyway, they're the, they're the only six plate stoves, uh, plates that, that I was able to get and collect and sell. So everything else that you see is going to be the jam stoves. Uh, we'll move down to this particular plate. Um, it's very similar to this. Uh, but it doesn't have the initials of IB, and I'll show you this. So you can see the B, and you can see that it looks like an I, it's really a J, and that stands for John Barr. What's significant about this plate is we have good provenance on it. This plate I bought from Roy Ackerman. The doctor had two of them, and he purchased them through uh, Hayden's Up, who had a farmhouse on the present property of Bed Creek, and there's a farmhouse that now is the Greenkeeper. And that's where these two plates were. And we know it's a good plate, we know, I mean, we know it came from there because he had his son and daughter, each he gave each of them a plate. So one had the left, one had the right. Um, I bought the right, um, I think it was from the son, and I think the daughter kept the other plate. So, you know, and with that also came a piece of glass that we'll talk about a little later. So Lloyd said if he went to plate, you got to buy a piece of glass. So <laughs> I did that, and I'm um, glad I did, you'll see why. So, uh, the next plate. Normally I would walk away and I would have bought a plate like this because of the condition of it. So when a plate came up for auction, I would typically look at it and determine, okay, is that something I want? Um, then I would start doing some research on it. Well, there's a book out there called The Iron Bible by Henry Mercer. And I don't know if any of you heard about it, but it's a book that um, Henry Mercer started a collection of stove plates down in the Doylestown area. And you can go see his collection today. Um, and what's interesting about it is he has probably close to 300 plates or more. And if you ever have a chance to go down there, do it. Um, it's on the very top floor. I think it's like five stories up and all that. But um, it's beautiful to see what he has. Um, he has a couple of hero plates, but nothing that rivals what this particular plate is. So. But anyway, um, so as I was looking at this and studying it, I couldn't find anything like this in the Mercer book. And then I went through sales records. I couldn't find anything. And I've been collecting for you know, a long time. And I never, ever came across a plate like this. So I said, you know what, it's unique. Um, I've never seen one. It might be the only one out there. So I bought it and put it in part of the collection. So it's unique. I've never seen another one like it. Um, so that's why it's in this collection. And then lastly, uh, this particular plate is 1758. Um, the reason why this plate is significant uh, is because you can see in the heart, there's a little V. And we think that that might be the uh, initials of the carver. Not sure, but that's what's making this plate unique, we think. Um, Dick's going to be coming out with some interesting book or something, and I know he's talking on that. Dick's been doing a lot of studying on the carvers themselves. There's not a lot of notes, at least that I don't know. I'm sure Dick's going to teach me a lot. But we really don't know a lot about the carvers, and that's why I kept that plate, because it was pretty unique. That plate, it looks a little rusty and a little different. That's one plate that I haven't uh, conserved yet. Um, all these other plates they've gone over with dental tools and they get a little light gun oil on them and they do that periodically. But that particular plate hasn't been treated yet, so uh, that's something that we'll be doing soon. Um, on the table up here, oh, you know, I didn't talk about the pig. Gotta talk about the pig. This. So we have a pig, pig iron. I don't know if you all know what a pig is. That's the pig iron. Um, a lady came up to me, Helen came up to me, I think I was giving a lecture in Lytics, and she says, I have something that you might be interested in. We found it on our farm. My dad found it years ago, and she says, I, it has humor on it. Well, right away, that got my interest, and I said, oh, well, when can I see it tomorrow? And she goes, yeah. So I went over, and we started a relationship, and it was in, it wasn't, it, it was basically under, it, it was on like a bench in, in the barn. So it was oily, which was good. Um, it had paint on it. There was a lot of things about it. And uh, I kind of like said, well, I'll conserve it for you. Because she started, you know, we, we developed a relationship. So I had it for two years. And if you think of like when they get a can in the sea, they put it in distilled water, it goes through electrolysis, and that draws the salts out of it, you know, whatever's creating the rust and what have you. So that 
particular piece was in water for over two years with still water. I would change it out and all that. And, and the whole time I was doing that, never thought about purchasing it or anything like that. I just wanted to do it because it was an important piece and I knew that we needed to conserve it. Um, when it came time, there was an opportunity for me to purchase it when uh, Steve or when uh, Coleman was selling the, uh, he, had a, he had a sale up in his property and he was trying to talk her into putting it in the sale. Well, he was just trying to get people to come in and, you know, get more people interested in the sale. So I said, look, that can't go to sale. We've got to come to the terms and it's got to stay in Lancaster County or at least go into the museum. And she said, I agree. So I came to terms with the family and, and, and I purchased it. So those that don't know what pig iron is, the furnace made like, kettles and they made stove plates. They actually made, we found a few iron shots. So he made armament for Washington's army in the Battle of Trenton. Um, so we find all kinds of things. They made wagon, we call them wagon boxes. Uh, as part of the wagon wheel. We know they made that there. But the primary thing they made was pig iron. And pig iron, you can see this is how they did it. They cast the furnace and they put a trough out. And then they put the pig, the, the pig iron was put this way coming out. And it kind of looked like, I guess, baby sucking on the mother, okay? And they pig, and they call it pig iron. That's what I was always told. <laughs> So, so what you see here, this is actually upside down when it was poured, so the bottom of it is flat. But on it, it has, it has a Liza, it has humor, it's really clear uh, furnace. So we, we can date this piece. You know, Huber had the furnace between 1750 and 1757. So we know when that was. She showed me where her dad found it on the farm. Jack News was, um, when he was still living, he got some old maps out and down at the Lancaster Historical Society. And sure enough, where she showed there was a road that used to run from Elizabeth Furnace right into the, the lower and, and upper forges of, of Hopewell on the Hammer Creek. So I am sure that it fell off the wagon. He probably didn't know what happened, and it sat there for many, many, many years. And we're fortunate to get it. Yeah? Do you want to tell what the, the iron flowed into uh, a depression? Yeah. Like yeah, it was just like this. What was it in the ground? Or yeah, it was in the ground. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was in the ground. It's uh, and we find every once in a while up there we'll find a piece of um, uh, we'll find some iron ore that you know was shaped like this of uh, the, the, the the trench. And we actually have I have also in our in my collection down home. Well, it's not mine; it's part of the Coleman family. But because of our archaeological dig, we actually conserve this stuff. Um, I wouldn't say they're shovels, but what they did is as the iron flowed out, they would put the shovel like down with a diverter down and it would divert the iron into that pig and then when they were filled then he would move it back and put it down and then it would flow this way. So we have we have some of the iron that was left in the trench and shaped like this just like the shovel type thing was. Any questions on that? So it's a very important piece. It's the only one certainly from Huber's time that we know of. Um, even in our digs we find we have, we have a couple pieces like this. Uh, the only other whole pig that we that I know of is up at the William Penn Museum. They have one that says Elizabeth Furnace on it. It's a little longer and it's skinnier, uh, a lot easier to manage, not quite as heavy as that piece. So this piece actually on the inside is, is somewhat hollow. We put a, a camera up through it and it's hollow, at least up to here. So it was, but I feel confident that the rust has stopped and it's, it's, in, it's in good shape. So anyway, that's really rare. I'm so glad to see that part of the collection. So, and then I'm going to talk about the cannon stove. The cannon stove, he made, we, we, I, we know he made a bunch of them, but we only know of like three. And the one, which is probably the biggest one, and probably the prettiest one, was James Spears. Uh, they were like a stove heating company down in Philadelphia. Uh, they ended up, they, they acquired, they got one, I don't know how he got it, but he ended up giving it to the Franklin Institute. And... Like I said, we have pictures of it. The Franklin Institute, I've been in contact with them numerous times. They don't have it. They don't know if it was stolen. They don't know if they lost it when they moved from the present location to, or from where they were to the present location. They just don't know. They've been through the collection. They said, Jeff, we guarantee you, we do not have the cannon stove in our collection. So what we thought the Franklin Institute has, they don't have it anymore. The other one... Um, that's out there is it's a meeting house in Montgomery County Historical Society. They they have one that was in a local meeting house there. It's on display. It's in a lot worse shape. It's got metal bands around it, just hold it together. So it's it's not the best condition one. 
This particular one, um, it was purchased uh, some time ago. It was in a church. This church was founded in 1751. There's historical records that indicate that uh, George Washington took communion at this particular church. In 1899, it was torched and arson, and the only thing that survived was the stove. After 1899, we're not sure exactly what happened with the stove, where it was, but it was found in the 60s by an antique dealer, and it was in a, um, it was in a shack that the migrants were using to heat, you know, to put heat in the building, uh, when they came up to pick the, the cranberries in the box in New Jersey. So it came out of that. It's in remarkable shape. Uh, you can see it. It's down at the Heritage Center. There's just really no place to put it here on display. Um, the, the door, the door, this bottom door, we think, all oh, this is original. They, this probably was replaced at one point. This door is all original. So except for maybe the metal packing in this, it's, it's in beautiful condition. Uh, it's a three-piece stove. We're still not sure how they cast this. We look at it all the time. I've had numerous people study it. We're not sure how the feet were even cast in on the original. So it's for further studies down the, the road. But we're so blessed to get pictures of this. Uh, the Haddonfield, New Jersey Historical Society, they had this in the record. And uh, they were just a great source of information for me when I went down there. But again, it's uh, this particular photo was taken probably pretty close to after this you know, church was built. You can see the, some of the cemetery, that the, the, uh, the graves are still mound up. Um, so what's there today is they have, there's a corner piece, at each corner there's like a marker that outlines the size of the church, and then in the middle there's a, uh, there's a, a monument that has a picture of the church. Yeah. On the uh, feet, are, are they three separate castings, or are they... No, it looks like it's part of the It looks like it's part of the block. Uh, this 
one certainly is in the style of the Eiffel Cloister. But if you bought land from Spiegel back in 1762, this is what you would have gotten as a deed. So it's in really good shape. All the partners, so the two Stedmans and Henry Spiegel, their their uh, signature there along with their wives. And the other thing that's significant about it, it has two signatures here that have witnesses. Elizabeth Graham, you heard of Graham Park in Philadelphia, Dr. Thomas Graham. Well, after he passed away, she inherited the, the, the land and hence it became, you know, she donated it to the city, I guess. But Elizabeth Graham is there. And then more significant above that is Francis Hopkinson. And he's a signer of the Declaration of Independence. So again, uh, a lot of important signatures on that particular piece. And that was done on paper. Okay, then we get into this particular one. This, I'm, I'm not sure when, Stiegel sold this in 1763 to Elizabeth, Elizabeth Stedman Jr., which I think it was one of the Stedman's daughters. Um, I don't know the circumstances around it or anything like that, but I just think it's a pretty piece. I, this is the only one that I know of that I've seen in this particular style. Um, there could be other ones I don't know, but I like that, you know, it's, that's why I bought it, but it's nice. Um, these two pieces, uh, what's significant about these is in 1774, in February, Spiegel lost his glass house and because of the money that he owed. So he had to sell quite a bit of land or whatever he had to, to try to pay his debtors. And these two pieces are, are the property that he sold in February of 1774. So he sold these right before he went to prison. And that's why they're significant. Yeah? Going back to this still place, because you, you mentioned about a carver on the last piece. Yeah. Can you give us a, a, a simple explanation as to how the plates are made? Sure. So, um, and Dick knows this really well too, but they would take a piece of mahogany board and they would just put a bunch of them together and then it would be like putting boards this way, okay, have your solid piece, and then they would put boards this way to hold them together. And a lot of times nails, they, they'd be nailed and all of that. Um, you know, you'll read things that say there's no place that in existence of American carvers. Well, there's a bunch of them that are right up here at, uh, at Elizabeth Furnace. The Coleman's do own them. Now, they weren't in Spiegel's time, but they are, they were part of the furnace. So I think most of the carvings that I've seen up there were carvings that were um, uh, for a 10 plate stove and, and things like that. So they are really pretty. But I think, I think they were mahogany, right? Most of them? You know? Yeah. Yeah. The nails, it's interesting because they didn't bother to correct that. Yeah. So when they when they made the uh, impression in the sand, yeah. the nail impressions were left. Yeah. And it could have been very easy for a guy just to take them. And trial them out. Yeah. It's funny because I know of I know of thirteen examples of this particular plate um, that I that I've tracked down. So I know there's at least 13 of them that, that are still in existence today. Um, and the nails are, they all vary in what you see. Now some of them are really worn, so they're not, you know, really strong. Now I have another hero plate that is just about as good as this one. And, this came, and it came out with the Quickle Church over in southern York County. Um, and there was a leather, and, and what's interesting about it, they had, they, had, they had the other plate to it also, the other side. But it broke in half, so they were using that plate to, to hold the barn door shut. <laughs> you know, that, and that plate's gone. But family members who remembered as kids and all that, they were telling me about that it broke in half, and that's what they were using it for. That particular plate, you don't see the nail holes as much, or the nails as much. So, you know, maybe they took more interest in it back then. But I think that's why this plate never saw the light of day as far as becoming a true stove. Because, again, the line, you can see it going through. Um, it really messed up around the eye. It's nine, you know, it's, it's maybe they cared enough about it that they, they said, no, this plate was rejected. Yeah, Gene. <clears throat> How many plates could they produce from one carving? That's a good question, too. I mean, I, I don't think we know. Do you know, Nick? I don't think. I don't think you know. Probably a lot. Yeah, I think a lot, you know. You think the weight of the pig yeah. against the weight of a plate is probably close. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they were they were selling stone plates by the ton yeah. to the uh, various uh, enterprises in Philadelphia. Yeah. And that's why they're dispersed all over the place because people went to Philadelphia to make their purchase. Yeah. So uh, you could find you could find a hero plate, you know, within two hundred miles. 
resemble it. And certainly, they did have one carver who was exclusive for like Stegall or the Coleman's. He could have been doing stuff for Mary Ann Furnace or whatever. They, they, those carvers, they did move around. And we do see some similarities among the plates with other, with other carvers so, or other furnaces. So we're pretty sure that they did that. But um, any questions on the plate at all, Jerry? Yeah. Are any of the carvings still in existence? Yeah, there's a couple. Do you have any in your collection? No. Very few. Yeah, very few. Even Mercer was trying to find them. The one, the one example that Mercer has is European. The only American ones that I know of are the ones that the Coleman's have. I don't know of any other ones. And the ones they have are beautiful. I mean, they're just they're just beautiful. Yeah, Gene? You talked about making shot for a cannon. Yeah. But that would have been, and the Hessians that did the Hessian ditch, that would have all post-dated Stiegel's owning of the furnace, correct? Because he went bankrupt in 74. Yeah, the yeah. So that would that have been, would it, did the Coleman's operate it under the name of Elizabeth Furnace? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that never changed. For how long? Well, until, until the Coleman's, I'm not even sure when the, well, the furnace was in blast, in blast in 1750, and went out of blast in, in 1857. So it was in, it was in blast for a long time. So Elizabeth Furness was named for Henry Stiegel's wife, Elizabeth? Which one? Well, I think the first one. Well, no, I don't think, no, I think it was, no, I, I said correctly. I think it was named by Hubert. Because you have a you have a, a pig iron here that has Eliza, okay, um, and then Hubert on it. So to me, this proves it. I mean, there's, you, and you do see a lot of, Controversy and, and different writings on that, but I think this kind of sums it up because you've got a pig that was dated in his time and it has Elizabeth on it. So I'm sure that Huber named, named the, the furnace Elizabeth Furnace. Yeah. Another interesting thing that I've been pursuing uh, is the carving uh, of Huber's patterns. Yeah. But one, one thing that's really comical is uh, the lack of. Of uh, her spelling ability, mm. and uh, some of the stone plates, uh, you you just sit there and laugh yeah. at the way they tried to bring out the spelling, and it it showed that some of those carvers were German, mm. uh, because they wrote down what they heard, what went in their ear. Yeah. That's what they wrote down. But it was slightly German, okay? So uh, it's, it's really comical that, to me, it's really comical that nobody ever told the guy, hey, you spelled that wrong. Yeah. Uh, and, and including the uh, Iron Master, who was a. a yeah, you were thinking, well, here you, have, here you have two G's. Yeah. And then we have some that are LE. Why, did, why didn't he say, hey, buddy, you know? Yeah. That ain't how you spell my name. Yeah. <laughs> it just, Who knows? They just let it go. Yeah. Yeah. Some of them are really hilarious. Yeah. yeah. So that's it. So if you have any other questions, I'm going to turn it over to Jeremy. He's going to tell you a little bit about Glass and his history, and then I'm going to be specific on the pieces that we have here. All right, Jeremy? All right. Hello, I'm Jeremy Friedley, uh, glassmaker. Uh, over on the end of the campus here, we're in a little tan building. You may have stopped in and, and seen us work before. Uh, I'll kind of touch back on what, why we're there today. So as many of you may know, glass was made at different periods for different events in Mannheim. Uh, they had made some glass in the square in the 1960s and uh, further on, I believe, into the 1970s. And, some glass making was done uh, over at the Phasic House kind of area. And some of you may know more about this than myself. Uh, touch back a little. I was, uh, I'm from Laramie, Wyoming, but I was raised in Elizabethtown, so not too far from Mannheim. But our organization that continues to operate today, Stiegel Glass Works 76, uh, was actually formed for the bicentennial here in Mannheim. And uh, two founders that come to my mind of that would be Jerome Hershey, uh, along with Skip Hetrick. And uh, Skip had been the president of our organization uh, from sort 
sort of a resurgence that he was a part of uh, about 12 years ago, and maybe even the conversation probably started prior to that. But uh, Skip wanted to see if they could create another glass making house, and have glass blowing available to the community with the history. It's a nice thing to be able to have uh, visual access to glass blowing. I like to say that you know we probably wouldn't be here today uh, if, it, if it wasn't for uh, Skip Hetrick especially. And I know there's a lot of other people who could be mentioned who have done a lot of things for the organization, uh, but Skip has really, really kept things moving here. So uh, yeah, and the Historical Society has allowed us to uh, hunker into their building, uh, which has been great. So we're over there making glass most weeks. Uh, we have an electric furnace today, which, as you know, is much different than the furnace that would have been operated about a block away on the original factory site. Uh, we don't create a ton of, uh, say, reproductions of Stiegel glass, uh, not only because they, they are difficult to make, uh, but because we seem to have been able to find the market making seasonal and craft type items has a very broad appeal. but. We do make some reproduction type works uh, by request. All right. So the glass making itself is really an interesting subject. I'll just give you a very summarized history. So depending on what authority you speak with, they've been melting glass for four to 5,000 years. Uh, the oldest writing in existence about glass making goes back to Mesopotamia. And it simply states that the gods came and showed them what to mix to melt glass. Now, moving on from there, about 1,200 years ago, give or take, probably gives some more, but 1,200 years ago, off the coast of Syria, near the Palestine region, a people called the Phoenicians were the first to create sort of a blowpipe and a double-bladed tool very similar to the jacks that we still use today and that would have been used at the Siegel factory as well. Uh, but that was when the blowing of glass began. Now, Italy has a very famous glass-making region, Murano, and that's there because now, around 900 years ago, the Phoenicians uh, had to leave the region they were in, and we know the Crusades were going on at that time. Now, the Phoenicians did not fit into either side of that conflict. Um, we could talk all day about what the Phoenicians practiced, but at that point, 900 years ago, they immigrated to Italy. And uh, they had laws in place up until the 19th century that it was illegal for the glassmakers to leave the region with that information. A uh, big thing that kept those laws in place so late were mirrors, mirrorized glass. Uh, the only mirrorized glass in the world was coming from Italy. Anywhere else, if you wanted to make your own mirrors, uh, you were polishing metals. Now, the way that this connects to the Stiegel uh, plant in particular is, you know, Italy wasn't the only area that was able to blow glass that sort of spread uh, from those Phoenicians. Um, and I am not an expert, but I see it as sort of the Roman Empire being very vast. Areas of Germany were part of that also. So they were had access to that glass making information. From what I understand, uh, the craftsmen at the Siegel factory were mostly German or all German descent. Uh, I haven't heard anything specific about an Italian making glass. Uh, but if we go to early American history, something that's, that's pretty neat to me, uh, does anybody here know what the first attempt at industry with the intention of exporting was uh, in early American colonies? So Jamestown, Virginia, in, uh, yesterday it threw me off a little bit. And I want to say 1606, but I think it might be 1608. Uh, they built a glass blowing studio. Well, I call it a studio. I'm sure they did. Uh, but they were producing fine glass in Jamestown Colony with the intention to ship that glass, export that glass back to Europe. Uh, they failed to export any glass in 1608. They tried again in 1612 with mostly German workers, much like Mannheim. Uh, but interesting thing about Jamestown was they did have an Italian glassmaker, at least one, during that 1612 campaign to make glass. 
For me, that's really interesting because uh, there's exciting to me uh, about how that craftsman came from Italy, with that being illegal at the time. All right, now back to uh, Mannheim and glass making and the history. Uh, it's just really unique. Uh, we really take pride in being able to create glass here in Mannheim. And, you know, our mission overall, again, is pretty simple, and it's to have access by the community to glass making in town. All right, any, any questions about any information I've given you thus far? Any questions about blowing the glass? <laughs> so, you know, a lot of the techniques haven't changed very much. Uh, if at all. You know, the biggest changes that we're looking at between the way glass was made uh, in, in the Stiegel factory and the way we make glass today is basically the ways that we will fuel our furnaces or achieve those temperatures. Uh, essentially, to get glass in a molten state, you're looking at 2,000 degrees. Somewhere in that ballpark, we run at 2150. Um, so they would have been getting their furnaces very hot. Jamestown, Virginia would have been wood-fired furnaces. Um, yesterday, I'm always learning, I'm no expert, but yesterday I learned that they would have fired their furnaces with coal here in Manna. So just something I always just assumed, you know, oh, it must have been wood-fired. But here it wasn't, so I learned that yesterday. Uh, but the tools we use today and the process of making the glass is almost identical. Um, again, I'm no expert, but something I've always found really interesting about Stiegel glass and early American glass uh, is uh, these beautiful patterns. Uh, we know a lot of these forms, uh, say the pocket flasks that, that were made, um, they were coming out of cast iron molds, two-part molds at times. Uh, you couldn't achieve some of these shapes without a two-part finishing mold. Uh, so just a really obvious connection then to having the iron foundry and that allowing them to create molds to use in their glass houses. Some of the molding that I've seen, um, I can see sort of a mimic effect of Venetian glass. And again, the Italians weren't very big, they're still not very big on sharing a lot of information, although the Italians are responsible for the American studio glass renaissance, which started in the 1970s. So that's when they were willing to you know, come over here and show us you know, how, to, how you do this. Uh, so when I see these Stiegel pieces, uh, such as the lidded jars with a, almost a quilted or diamond pattern, uh, for over 500 years, the Italians have used a little brass mold called a pineapple mold. Uh, you can picture sort of a waffle iron effect inside of that mold. And uh, that mold, a bubble goes in hot, it's filled with air, and then you have to remove some air while you're hot in order to get out of there. If you don't get out of there fast enough, uh, the glass will become stuck in that mold. It takes, I've chipped those quite a few times, it takes a long time. Uh, but a piece like the jars with that quilted look, um, although, although I tend to think that those were achieved out of cast iron molds, you know, I, I just, for me, I imagine them seeing Italian glass, which they had been making glass for a long time at that point. But the inspiration, where they were going, you know, how are they doing this? How are they achieving this? Uh, but it's really neat without being able to ask an Italian craftsman, you know, straight up, how do you achieve this? So then they went about sort of reverse engineering some of these things. So it's not an identical effect or an identical tool or process all the time, which I just think is really neat. All right. Yes? Did the terms glass blower and glass cutter refer to the same craft? No. So, um, and you know, all through Europe, early American glass, uh, you have engravers and then you have glass blowers. So we refer to it as cold workers and hot workers. So somebody like myself, I'm, I'm a hot worker. I'm uh, productive when I'm given molten glass. Um, I do know how to grind and cut a little bit, but I would not be very productive. <laughs> um, I had the opportunity to watch a uh, check cutter in his 90s. Uh, probably one of the best engravers alive today by hand. And 
just on a simple cutting wheel with a plate of glass. He could approach that and make your portrait. It fast. But, you know, he was in his 90s. He started engraving glass when he was, I think he said, nine years old. So that was a lifetime of that being his sole focus. Um, they would have used, I don't want to take any information that Jeff may give you later, uh, but a lot of the, of what you see, the engraving on the Stiegel work, that was done with copper wheels. Which that's kind of neat because we know in, even in ancient times they were capable of quite a bit more than we maybe expect from copper. Whether it's stonemasonry and cutting um, or engraving glass. Now today we tend to use diamond because it's very fast. Uh, but we have wheels that are electroplated with you know, the littlest bits of industrial diamond. So, I mean, that just tears through it. So I, I assume it would have taken a little bit more patience uh, to work with the copper, but very neat. Yes, sir. Can we go back to the, uh, the two-part iron light? Yes. Is that a two-man operation when you're doing that? I, 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 you've got to get the glass out of there and out of the water yeah. and everything and still so typically, and a lot of times today, we're using fruit woods in our molding. Uh, but normally, as I know, you would have one person working the mold who's uh, down in the bowl. And then, and then you have somebody who's hitting the mold with the glass. So they're, they're determining if the temperature and the timing is right. And so they're going to go into that mold. The person working the mold is going to close that mold. And then the glass blower is applying an amount of pressure. Usually they're bouncing just like this. Uh, but when they're ready, and I believe it was probably the same then, there's going to be a tap of the foot. So when you're working that mold, when that gaffer, so the gaffer is you know kind of the head guy, say in Siegel's factory. He knows how to make the products, and so he's going to let everybody else know how things are going to happen. But when that foot is tapping, that's pretty universal in glass. That means open this mold before the glass breaks inside. You have a, a very tight range of temperature when you're blowing into a mold that if it's able to get cooler than it should within that mold, it's not likely to survive coming out of that mold. So it's all very critical. Uh, much like playing an instrument, when you think of timing and how that applies, very similar in glass making where early on that you're making glass, you may be counting off in your mind, you may be counting your steps, but then, you know, after, say, 15, 20 years, you're no longer counting, but that rhythm is sort of burnt in. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Question. Yeah. Now, I have a question. Does anybody know if any molds from the glass making are still in existence? I've asked the different crowds a few times throughout the years, and uh, it seems to be that the answer is no. But what we, I would assume, and maybe somebody had put the seed in my ear, uh, that a lot of those molds, tools, things that could be continued to be used were. So they were, it's very possible that they were moved to another glass making operation. And uh, that may also contribute to uh, the idea that, you know, we all know it's hard to identify or, or authenticate whether a piece is truly steel glass. And, you know, uh, I know a lot of the glass making industry continued in Pennsylvania and areas post steel but it also went to uh, New Jersey at glass making during that period, uh, Virginia. Start, and so some of those molds may have went to other factories and continue to be used creating more confusion to what came from mankind and what did All right. Thanks, Jeremy. You're welcome. So I'm going to quick take you through the collection over here. If you have any questions, but just won't let that long. And uh, I'm going to, I'll stick around here and you can talk to me and you'll have your questions then at the end. Um, so basically what you have here is you have a couple different styles that he did. He did a lot of enameling, and we know that. Um, he had, we're not sure exactly how many enamelers, but it seems like they all had their own little techniques. Some were heavier, some were lighter on what they did. Some did buildings, some did more floral things, some did the fancy peacock or the, the rooster, one did the dove. So there's 
all different kinds of things, but um, you know, we did some milk glass, we have a typical flips that you see, um, and you'll see a lot of these out there. So again, it's like Jeremy said, we can't contribute any of these to Stiegel because again, after he, you know, his shop was short-lived, and then the, you know, the enamelers, they went other places. I'll say this, that we do have records in the state archives of some of the stuff that Stiegel did, and from the years, all of, six, uh, all of 1769 through January, February, and March of 1770, we know that Stiegel did uh, roughly, it was, it was over 400 different, uh, or uh, 43, I'm sorry, 43 different types of things, and that doesn't include the window glass. So, you know, we're just looking at a little sampling of what he did, but there's literally 43 different items that he made back then. Out of glass. Out of glass, yeah, out of glass. And I added up the numbers that I saw in there, and they came up to like 66,000 pieces that he did in that time period. So, if that's true, that's just a remarkable amount of production that he was putting out. Okay, if you want to tell him what a flip is? Well, I, I mean, I don't know why it's got its name, but that's a flip there that you see basically these glasses without any, you know, handles on them. Then we do have some mugs that has a handle on it. And, uh, we have a mug down there, so they call them flip. How they got the name, I don't know. Do you know, Jeremy? No, I don't know. I don't know. And then we'll run down here. Um, this particular case, so there are a few things that they can attribute to steel. And the reason is because there's, you know, when the, when the blowers went other places and all that, for whatever reason, they didn't do this particular pattern or whatever at that particular glass house. So, certainly what we call the diamond daisy, that's probably the most famous of, of the Stiegel work out there, and there's, you know, you see them in a lot of the museums out there. This particular piece, uh, I drove to Maine to get that, it was at an auction, this came out of the Midwest. What's rare about this is it's a hexagon pattern, and it's really rare. I think it's like one of five known. I know Corning has a couple, and Winchester has a couple, and I was able to secure that piece, so it's glad to see this have a home. Um, the sugar bowls, you've seen that before. Uh, what makes this a steagle piece is if you look at the finial up there, there's little swirl lines in it. That they attribute that to Stiegel too. So if you see that, you can almost be assured that that was done by Stiegel type thing. There are some glass, or, or there is some glass, clear glass pieces that also have a finial that's done like that, not like in that blob form. You know, is that steel? It could be, but we don't just don't know for you know for sure. I wish it had the swirl finial on it, but it doesn't. So. And then he made, uh, he did make some horns and uh, other toys, uh, like cows and all that, you know, we have some records of. But to say that that's Stiegel, we don't know for a fact. Uh, that's the one piece that I've been after Jeremy to duplicate for me. And <laughs> still not sure if it's good. You're going to do it? I'll give you a shot. All right, good. <laughs> um, the one piece I do want to go back to real quick is this little piece. I talked to you earlier about the sink well that Boy Ackerman said. It goes with the collection, you have to get it. This was also in that house. And it's the only piece in all of this collection that I did not want to sell. And Mr. Doug back here, he basically got on his knees and said, Jeff, we really need it. <laughs> so I did sell it to him. Uh, it's, I'll tell you, Corning doesn't have an example of this. Winterthur, the Metropolitan Museum, nobody has a sample of this particular type of inkwell that's enameled like this. It, I'm sure he made other ones like this, but I've never seen it, so. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty special piece to me. I just love it. It's really special. Uh, again, he made creamers. He made the salts. And then Jeremy was talking about the copper engravings that you see up here. He did some different things like that. Nice little jelly one in the middle. You don't see many of them. That's pretty rare. Um, when you have a chance afterwards, look at the mug here and look at the, uh, the large flip. When you look at the, the engraving on it, it's probably done by the same engraver. It's very similar. Everything about everything that you see there is, is pretty much the same. And of course, wine glasses and whatever. So we have some examples here. There's Stiegel's mansion. We have his office. I'm not sure if he sold stuff out of his office or not. Um, anyway, so that's it. And appreciate you coming. As far as you know, though, yeah. uh, Stiegel himself was not an art art. I don't think he was. He was just a businessman. Yeah, I think so. Because yeah, I think he started when he started with Huber, he was basically doing his books. So yeah, I don't think he had that, that skill set. But you know. I'm just in, in closing, I'm just saying I'm just happy that this stuff, you know, ended up in Anaheim. It could have gone a lot of different places, but you know, working with Wes and the acquisition committee for literally a long time. <laughs> months, um, yeah, it's 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 where it belongs, so I'm just glad it's here.
Thank you. Thank you.